So in this next video and next flowchart, we'll conclude our discussion on learning and entitle this next flowchart Learning 3. In this final video on learning, which is of course an animal behavior that we're studying, we're going to of course be remembering what the idea of learning is all about. Learning is simply the creation of a link, and that link is specifically between both experience and behavior. So we'll write that down between experience plus behavior. In this final learning uh, video on animal behavior, we'll look at a couple of more higher order types of learning, and we'll start that understanding by looking at something called cognition. So this is a very high order type of learning, something that you and I undergo many, many times, especially as college students, as people who are in school and learning t subjects. This is simply defined as complex learning. So cognition is very complex learning. It is not learning of associations. It's not learning via positive negative reinforcement or physiological responses, but this is simply a lot more complex. Uh, we can broadly consider this the process of, this is the process of gaining knowledge. And when we think of knowledge, we think of that as a broad understanding of complex things. And this is specifically usually referred to as the idea of thinking. When humans think, thinking in humans, they are undergoing cognitive processes that are very high, high order and very, very complex in their brain orientation and the way that the brain functions specifically. A good way to understand cognition overall is to look at something like problem solving. That is a cognitive event, that is a cognitive pattern of learning, and thus it is a cognitive behavior as well. It is an animal behavior that is going to establish a link between experience and behavior, but that link is going to be relatively complex. What I mean by problem solving is the following. It's simply the ability to devise, the ability to devise a method to overcome a method to overcome this is something we do all the time as students obstacles so when you have a question in front of you you need to solve that problem you need to solve that question and you use certain methods and all of those methods that you're using are trying to utilize a link that you hopefully created between your experience and hopefully that results in the correct necessary cognitive behavior in addition we can say that problem solving is not only this ability to devise a method but it's also the ability to do something correct the first time ability to do something correct first time why is this different than what we've been studying thus far in learning? Well, simply speaking, in before, especially in associative learning, we needed some sort of cue, usually a physiological response based off of, the, let's say, meat powder being our cue, or a positive reinforcement like food in order to cause us to learn. But problem solving and cognition altogether is all about being able to solve that problem correct the first time. This does not involve trial and error. Um, more, it involves a bit of it, but not as much, of course, as associative learning. I think a good way to understand this is, of course, always, always look at an example. And the example that we'll look at in this idea of problem solving is the classic chimp example. So chimps are very smart animals. They're higher order animals. If you put chimps in a room, let's imagine, and this is, these are studies that actually have been done. Let's say you put uh, chimps in a room, maybe one, maybe two, and you hang bananas on the ceiling. You might already know where we're going with this. A lot of psychology in this lecture, hang bananas on ceiling, you are creating a problem. You are creating a problem for these chimps. Chimps want the food, but the food is out of reach. What you will notice is that, let's say there are boxes within the room, chimps will have the ability, the cognitive ability, the complex ability to pile boxes. So we'll say chimp will pile 
boxes. And this is something you know, you know, it seems doesn't seem like that crazy of an idea, but you have to understand this is a higher order problem and a higher order solution. That's something that many animals will never be able to do simply because they cannot undergo a complex learning pattern such as this. So the chimp will pile boxes, of course, all the way on top of each other on top of each other. Why is, why, are the, why is the chimp doing this? It's simply because if you put the boxes on top of each other closer and closer in order to get the bananas on the ceiling. So that seems like a very simple problem and a simple solution, but in the context of the entire animal behavior world, this is very complex. This is a correct on the first time method to overcome an obstacle that's all about thinking. It's all about gaining knowledge and understanding and experience and creating a relatively uh, smart, let's say, behavior. And finally, in problem solving, we have to remember that this type of idea, of course, varies among not only um, species, but also varies among the individuals. So some individuals are able to problem solve certain things better than uh, other individuals, meaning of the same species, and even, uh, of course, between species. Our problem solving abilities are greater than those of the chimp, um, but between ourselves individually, we definitely have variations in our problem solving capabilities. Another type of learning that we have to understand, another complex type, um, is the following. It's simply the development of learned behaviors. So let's look at this. Development of what we would consider learned behaviors. How do they develop? And we have a really, really cool example that I really, really like about this that really shows just how much development plays a role in understanding learning and thus an understanding behavior and experience. What we can say about the development of the learned behaviors is simply that there's going to be a length of time for learning. And that length of time varies. Length of time for learning. So this is the idea of development of learning. Length of time for learning um, to occur varies. So in order to learn, the amount of time it takes varies between individuals and between species. The super cool example for this that I really, really appreciate um, are sparrows. So an example would be sparrows. Sparrows uh, have to sing a particular song. So that's a very specific behavior. Have to, let's say, have to sing a very particular song that only sparrows sing. So, in order to understand that the development happens for this learned behavior, this is not an innate behavior. Some birds might have an innate behavior to sing, but in sparrows, they do not. They have to learn it. And that learning takes time, and that learning takes a developmental amount of time, as you'll see through this example. In sparrows, we notice that fledglings, fledglings are just young sparrows. Fledglings, the younger sparrows, have a, specific, have a sensitive period. And we know what a sensitive period is. That's that period in which they really are um, adept to learning. Sensitive, let me rewrite that. Have a, fledglings have a sensitive period. And we know that in a sensitive period, this is about 50 days for the fledglings, in a sensitive period, they actually don't sing. This is interesting right now. They don't sing during this sensitive period, about 50 days, but all they do, all they do is just listen to the adult. So they're just listening and listening and listening to adult. The adult can sing. The adult sparrow, who is uh, definitely able to sing, does sing. And this is supposed to say uh, fledgling. So there's a G here, I believe. Uh, fledglings. Let me put a G right there. So. You just listen to the adult over and over and over again, and then hopefully, eventually, you actually memorize the song. So this young sparrow, this fledgling, just listens, it does not sing, and it memorizes the song after listening during its sensitive period of about 50 days. And then what we notice is that this, these young fledglings will chirp. They will make small chirping noises in response. So again, response, stimulus, all these ideas are coming together. Chirp in response to own song, to own song of their population. 
So sparrows know their own song. They innately know what is correct and what is not correct, but they just don't know how to sing it. And what they're going to do is when they do hear the correct thing, they will chirp. And that will be their response to tell themselves that this is my population song. This is a song that I have to eventually learn through this 50 days of sensitive period. And then this is considered maybe the first phase of development. And then finally, there's going to be what we could, would consider a second phase of development. Second phase of DEV for development in these fledglings is the following. Eventually, what's going to happen now, we consider these not fledglings, but we'll consider them juveniles, a little bit older than young fledglings. These juveniles um, are actually going to sing, but they're still not going to be just right there yet. They're going to actually sing what we call sub-songs. And these sub-songs are similar to the main song that needs to be sung, that all adult sparrows have. But what's going to happen is over time, modification. So there will be modifications. I'll just write uh, modus for modifications. Modifications until it, as in the juvenile, matches adult song. So over, look how Look how complex this behavior is. Look how learned this behavior is. Look how developmentally capable this behavior is. There's a lot of development that has to occur. A lot of steps have to happen. You have to first listen, then you have to memorize, and you have to chirp to make sure you're responding to the right thing, and then you try and try and try. You modify, you modify, you modify, and then finally you get the song in your head. When you get the song in your head, we say that the song crystallizes, in this young bird's head, in this young sparrow's brain. And when the song crystallizes, this young fledgling is now, of course, much closer to a sparrow and will sing this forever, sings forever. We'll just squeeze that in here. So that's a very complex set of learned, developmentally capable behaviors, developmentally reliant behaviors. And finally, last thing in this flowchart, a very short thing to learn is social learning. Social learning is very, very important, especially in the human context. This is simply learning to solve problems. Learning to solve problems. So we'll say probs for problems by observing behaviors of others. So this is a cool way of figuring out how to solve things by observing behaviors of others. And that's what we mean by social learning. We use the, our society that's around us to learn those behaviors. And specifically, we can always refer to social learning in the context of culture. That's simply what it utilizes. And culture is simply going to be considered in animal behavior just a system of information transfer. Much like in the uh, how we have a culture that every single you know nationality or race has that's going to be a system of information transfer that allows every you know person to solve problems in their own unique way. That's the idea of social learning in a nutshell. Overall, these are our very complex learning procedures and ways to understand behavior. Remember, we always want to go back to this link between experience and behavior. Clearly, we have an experience that these young fledglings have. Clearly, we have an experience that these chimps have that combines directly with a learned behavior.